Hey, 42 here. Every year, millions of people visit the seaside to enjoy the sun and the waves. It's a charming sight to see happy holiday makers playing with their balls and splashing about in the ocean. Then again, it's obvious these nutters haven't paid even a moment's thought to what they're sharing the water with. And I don't just mean gallons upon gallons of their fellow sun seekers' urine. The ocean is full of all sorts of weird and scary creatures. Only a maniac would knowingly and willingly spend time around. The obvious place to start is with sharks. Of course, sharks in general have a bad but largely unfair reputation as being the killers of the sea. Your chances of being attacked by a shark are only about 1 in 3.75 million, less than the chance of dying from a lightning strike or meeting Beyonce. Now, I'll admit those odds will shorten considerably if you're the kind of weird person who likes swimming around in open water whilst wearing the still bleeding carcasses of recently deceased fish. But hey, if that's your thing, I'd argue you're asking for it. Most sharks are scary in a fairly run of the mill, it's going to eat me kind of way. I'm looking at you, Great White. But other, less well known varieties bring their own brand of weird to add to the deadly mix. Take the frilled shark, for example. With a snake like body that grows to be over 2 meters long and 300 razor edged teeth spread across 25 rows. It basically looks like the world's most dangerous eel. I wonder if it has balls. But there are far weirder creatures waiting out there in the sea than sharks. Take the sarcastic fringe head, for example. So named for its tendency to make snarky comments about its mates. Apart from having the best name of any creature in the sea, or anywhere else for that matter, the sarcastic fringe head is able to expand its entire face into one massive mouth when it feels threatened. So basically like a more sarcastic version of Predator, except it lives in a shell and probably can't turn invisible. Also hanging out on the ocean floor and eating dead stuff is the giant isopod. It's totally harmless, but looks like a two and a foot half long version of your worst cockroach nightmare. Then there's the Northern Stargazer. He sounds friendly enough, uh, but this bug-eyed creep with a face that looks like it's been crapped out by a sea cucumber burrows itself into the ocean floor before electrocuting passing victims with extreme prejudice. And whilst I'm talking about sea cucumbers, have you ever seen anything so unfortunate? They look like the love child of a slug and the large ball of snot. And I can tell you from experience, they're absolutely useless if you want to make tzatziki. Far more disgusting than this, though, is the pearl fish, which hides from predators by burrowing into the sea cucumber's anus. Talk about living in the arse end of town. I could go on forever with the list of the freakiest freaks of the seven seas, naming cannibalistic lobsters, sea lice, sea fleas, and even a delightful flesh-eating bacteria. But let me save us some time by zooming in on nature's most finely tuned blend of scary and gross. It's a worm that grows up to three meters long and digs itself into the seafloor leaving only the tip of its body exposed. That body has a hard outer shell coloured like a rainbow, but not exactly in a Care Bears kind of way. The worm's head, if you can call it a head, is decorated with five antennae it uses to sense its prey, and a pharynx, a set of vicious jaws that can snap tight on a fish so quickly and with so much force, the unlucky critter is sometimes split clean in two. Frankly, that's probably the best way to go, because the rest of this worm's victims, often way bigger than the worm itself, are dragged back to its underground house before they even know what's happening. Scientists don't yet know what goes on in the worm's lair, but it's definitely not pretty. Take a moment to look at this nightmarish creature and tell me what you see. If you're jumping up and down on your couch shouting, dismembered penis, well done, because this animal brought to you straight out of Satan's own nightmares is the Bobbit Worm.
apparently named after a rather unfortunate incident in the early 90s, when Lorena Bobbitt sliced off her husband John's penis. In case you don't remember the details of the story, Lorena, whose maiden name was Kutya Kukov, it wasn't, I made that up, claimed in court her husband was abusive and had, one night, finally gone too far, whilst John claimed he was the innocent victim of a woman with a bad case of cray cray. Both went on trial for different crimes, causing a worldwide media sensation, though both were ultimately acquitted. Lorena went on to lead a fairly normal life as a beauty technician and as an advocate for survivors of domestic violence. John followed a more eclectic career arc, dabbling in construction work, truck driving, circus performance, WWE wrestling appearances, and even starring in two adult films, which were dubious by even porn standards. John Wayne Bobbitt, uncut, and John Wayne Bobbitt, frankenpenis. In case you're wondering how John was able to uh, perform in these classics of the silver screen, his manhood was actually in full working order. Thanks to an amazing doctor, he managed to sew everything back together after police found John's penis abandoned in a field. Lorena had thrown it out of the window of her car whilst taking a drive to cool off in the aftermath of the whole penis severing thing. The plastic surgeon in question was experienced in microsurgery and had previously put together fingers and the likes but he'd never done the same job with a penis. Astonishingly, despite having no memory of performing this operation before, he somehow managed to successfully remember just in time. So, how did this mess of a story lend itself to the naming of a worm at the bottom of the sea? Is it because the worm looks like it's being cut in half? Or is it perhaps because it sticks out further and further the more excited it gets? The answer to that lies with Dr. Terry Goslinger, a senior curator at the California Academy of Sciences, who gave the Bobbit worm its common name. According to Goslinger, he first saw the worm in the wild in 1992 and included it in his reference book, Coral Reef Animals of the Indo-Pacific. This was around the time of the Bobbit trial, and the marine researcher apparently felt inspired by the similarity between what Lorena Bobbit had done to her husband and the Bobbit worm's ability to cut through a fish's spinal column with its scissor like jaws. Obvious, right? If you're Freud. Of course, the Bobbit worm has a real name Eunice Aphroditeus. But most people seem to prefer the one inspired by the severed penis, so we'll go with that. It forms part of a class of segmented worms called Polychaeta, named after the chaetas, or bristles, typically found running along their bodies. Some Polychaetas use their bristles for self-defense, like the fireworm that can cause terrible skin reactions if touched. The bobbit worm doesn't seem to use its bristles in this way though, Instead, they're probably useful for locomotion, helping the worm to move up and down its burrow as quickly as it does. As for that burrow, I don't really want to imagine what goes on down there, especially not if you're a fish unfortunate enough to have been captured. Ecologists specializing in polychaetas suspect the worm first injects its prey with a toxin that allows it to then ingest and digest its food. But all of this is speculation, because the bobbit worm has so rarely been studied in its natural environment. In fact, as a testament to its special level of weird, we aren't even sure if we know how to classify this thing properly in the first place. When classifying biological organisms, scientists follow a naming hierarchy, which is basically like a family tree. At the top is the domain, of which there are three. Bacteria, Archaea, which are single-celled organisms without a cell nucleus, and Eukarya, which are organisms made up of cells with a nucleus. Pretty much anything you might think of as a visible living thing, including yourself, your dog, that mold growing on your bread, or your neighbor Daryl, is part of that domain. 
Within each domain, there are three different kingdoms, such as animals, plants, and fungus. Again, you and your dog are part of the kingdom of animals, whilst the mold and Daryl are part of the kingdom called fungus. Within each kingdom, there are multiple filler. In the animal kingdom, there are 35, and you and your dog fall within the phylum chordata because you have a backbone, at least most of the time. Within phylla, there are classes. You and your dog form part of the class mammalia, whilst, as you'll recall, our friend Eunus Aphroditeus, the bobbit worm, is part of the Polychaeta class. Classes are broken into different orders, and this is where you and your dog part ways, because you form part of the primates, and she belongs to the carnivorans. Orders break down into different families, such as the hominids, which is where humans fit in, along with other great apes. And then families are divided into genera, which are further divided into species. Our species is Homo sapiens, your dog's is Canis lupus or Canis familiaris, depending on which biologist you're drinking with. And Daryl's? Well, we're not sure about Daryl. And it turns out people aren't sure about the bobbit worm either. Initially, it was thought to be its own species, but it could be a whole new genus altogether. I want to say we should call it Daryl, but maybe a more appropriate name would be Barry. In 2008, the Nuki Blue Reef Aquarium in England started noticing problems in one of their tanks. Coral was being moved around and broken, and prize fish were being attacked. But there was no evidence of a culprit. The curator and his team laid traps at night, but those were destroyed too. Even the hooks disappeared. The only thing left to do was to drain the tank and dismantle it, one rock at a time. And that's when Barry showed up, a 1.2 meter long bobbit worm who'd been camping out undetected in the sand of the tank floor. It's thought Barry probably arrived in his larval state, hidden in a piece of coral that was added to the tank, and then grew fat on the easy pickings. In the wild, the bobbit worm sticks to warmer waters in the Atlantic and Indo-Pacific, and is believed to live three to five years which is unnecessarily long in my opinion. It also seems to have been around for ages. Hundreds of fossilized worm burrows dating back 20 million years were recently found in Taiwan, and scientists believe they were either made by bobbit worms or something very similar. Because invertebrates like worms hardly ever fossilize, they're much too squishy, it's impossible to say with certainty but by the shapes of the creature's burrows, it seems like this two meter long, thin, cylindrical animal was lurking in the seafloor, jumping out to catch prey and then dragging it back underground. Sound familiar? But there is some debate about whether these ancient fossils really do belong to ancient bobbit worms. Dr. Terry Goslinger, the phallus-minded marine researcher we met earlier, says the same fossil markings could have been made by something far more docile than the bobbit worm he's so lovingly named. But it's hard to say, because no one has really studied the burrows of living specimens yet, so we have nothing to compare the fossils to. On the topic of dark, romantic hideaways, you're probably not wondering what the bobbit worm gets up to when it's feeling randy. But I'm going to tell you anyway, the truth is, we don't really know. We can only guess based on the behavior of other polychaetas. For them, spawning usually happens during a very small window of time brought about by the seasons, the phases of the moon, and possibly candlelight and the bottle of Merlot. Females attract males by releasing pheromones into the water which drives the males nuts and encourages them to release plumes of sperm. In response, the females release clouds of eggs, and fertilization happens somewhere in the floating currents overhead. I can definitely think of more enjoyable ways to achieve a similar result. But this is the way most polychaetas do things, or don't do things, depending on how you look at it. In some versions of this process, males and females have specially adapted back ends filled with sperm and eggs. Then, when spawning starts, the worms swim towards the surface before releasing their loads. Like I said earlier, I can think of a hundred good reasons not to go paddling about in the sea. 
But the idea of duck diving for a cloud of 3 metre long monster worms and their sperm is right near the top of that list. Thanks for watching. You can get your hands on my book, Stick a Flag in It, over on Amazon or on Audible. Links to both in the description below. Thank you.